Hello, thank you all for joining us uh, for our first Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office Lunch and Learn of 2024. Uh, today's presentation is on the Canadian County Jail and current preservation efforts. And today we are joined by Amy Nethery, uh, the head of the Jail Restoration Committee at Preservation El Reno. Amy is a lawyer who practices throughout Oklahoma. She's always loved old buildings and admires the craftsmanship that can be found in those buildings and in furniture. Amy and her husband, Tommy, one, uh, own one of the oldest homes in El Reno, which was Tommy's childhood dream home. While family members tried to talk them into buying a new home, Amy and Tommy wanted the features that only come with old buildings. Over the last several years, Amy has worked on preservation and recognition of her church's 100-year-old sanctuary, and the old jail will be Amy's first major uh, renovation project. But she's excited for people to see this amazing building. And so I am going to hand it over to you, Amy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and thank you for that thorough introduction. I'm not sure I have much more to add. Um, I'm Amy Nethery, and there's a picture of me and my homie at Christmas time. We kind of loving old buildings and old things. We love Christmas, and our home is ridiculously decorated, still decorated. We haven't had time to take the decorations down. Um, I, like Kristen said, I'm a lawyer. Uh, by day, and Tommy is an accountant by day, but really has his passion and love in research and genealogy, history, and I want to credit Tommy, he did most of the research for today's presentation. So we're here to talk about the old Canadian County Jail, but you can't talk about the jail and the jail's historic significance without talking about its architect, Solomon Layton. Solomon Layton, who you see there, um, is traced to at least 100 residential and commercial building designs. I suspect the number is actually quite higher, that there were a number of copycat designs, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, a number of people who loved his work so much that they then took it and recreated it in other cities and towns. But as of right now, there's a hundred, more than a hundred that are known traced to him. His nicknames included a useful citizen, a dean of Oklahoma City architecture, daddy architect, and in a recent conversation I had with Bob Burke, um, Bob referred to him as a genius and definitely agree. I think you'll see why. It is definitely unequivocal that Solomon Layton was a pioneer in architecture, not just architecture in general, but architecture in Oklahoma. In going back and looking at the designs that we know he did, his designs featured classical revival, neoclassical, second Renaissance revival, Spanish colonial, Gothic or Cherokee Gothic as Frank Lloyd Wright would call it, art deco and Italian Renaissance. So this is a very wide range and wide variety of design features for a single architect tells me one of two things. Either he was so in tune with what his clients wanted, and that very well could be the case because his clients also noted that he was a friend, a friend to all, a good friend. And so maybe he knew exactly what they wanted and he went out and researched and learned the design that would make his clients most happy. Also, alternatively suspect that he was the kind of person we know that his vacations would be going and seeing new buildings and I suspect that he would go to another state see a new building fall in love with the design and think I want to create that uh, much like me when I see the home improvement shows or a design on Pinterest I think oh I can do that whether I really can or can't and I think you get this sense that Solomon Layton was much like that himself. And that's why we have so many different design styles within a single architect. Most of us pass Solomon Layton buildings every day and, and don't realize it. I did read some commentators who said, hey, I can pick out a Solomon Layton building from anywhere. And granted, I don't have an architectural background or design 
instruction background, but I can't. Some, a lot of his buildings have domes. A lot of them don't. A lot of them were kind of the art deco, clearly built 2030 styles. A lot of them are not. Even among education buildings, which he did a gr great number of, he's attributed with actually 46 education facilities. Even that design varies very much from his commercial designs. So maybe there are people more trained and more versed in architecture who can drive by and point out a Solomon Layton building. I can't. And I assure you that you have probably seen Solomon Layton buildings without even realizing it. This map shows, and not to scale, but gives you a rough idea of all of the places where Solomon Layton architecture is found within the state of Oklahoma. Remember, these are the early days of automobiles, um, early days of Route 66 and ways of traveling when he would have been working. So he's um, we did have the inner urban and suspect that he used the inner urban a lot for getting from one town to another. But for his time period and when he was practicing, he's really all over Oklahoma and his architecture can be seen in a number of places. Solomon Layton was born in Iowa in 1864. He passed away in Oklahoma City in 1943. He's actually interned in Oklahoma City at Rose Hill off uh, 63rd and Western-ish. In 1885, he married Alice. They had two children, two daughters actually, but one of whom died in childhood. Solomon Layton was a Baptist and a Mason, and I don't think those two are necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, he actually held high ranks within the Masonic um, Brotherhood, including Shriner and a 32nd degree Mason. Solomon Layton worked on a number of buildings for the Masons, and that was one of the ways in which he gave back. Solomon Layton had no formal architecture training in that time that he worked. Most people didn't. There was some formal training available at a few universities. There was formal training available overseas, but he did not have any. We do know that he read works and read architecture books to further his knowledge. He grew up in a family of carpenters and builders and had worked around construction since he graduated with high, from high school. But again, when you look at the vast number of works, the types of works, and we're going to talk in a second about the structure of his works, the fact that he had no formal education it just makes him that much more of the genius that Bob Burke recognized. In 1902, Solomon Layton moved to El Reno, Oklahoma. He tried to get land from the lottery, did not, but nevertheless established a home here. And let's, yeah, I want you to kind of pause for a minute and think about the Oklahoma arc landscape in 1902. So we're three years post land run, we're still five years before statehood, we're still a territory. We are flat, very flat, flatter than we are today. There is not much more that is bigger than a one-story building, and at least in El Reno and what I have read about Oklahoma City, really at this time in 1902, we're not even getting into three-story buildings much. The local governments are just forming. Families are starting to transition from the rudimentary dwellings that they set up when they stake their land claims into more stately homes. And in towns that came up from the land run, like El Reno, we see a number of homes that were built between 1889 and 1907. So we've got this architecture and buildings popping up everywhere, kind of just out of the ground. Uh, the El Reno Courthouse was built in 1903. The Elks Lodge was transfer, transferred here from the 1904 World's Fair. Carnegie Library was built in 1905. Southern Hotel in 1906. And the jail we're going to talk about in 1907. So if you are a young wannabe designer, builder, architect, Oklahoma is a place to be, and it's a place to really establish your career, and that's exactly what Solomon Layton did. 
most people are going to know the name Solomon Layton from his design of the state capitol. And he was awarded that job in 1911. So we're talking just nine years after he started working in El Reno. He got that prestigious project, which also came with a $75,000 check and no doubt helped his business really establish. And for our generation, and I believe most of you that are here watching, You'll recall back in 2001, particularly 2002, Solomon Layton's name had a resurgence in this state because there was the campaign to put the dome on the Capitol like it was originally designed. That has been accomplished. We have fulfilled Solomon Layton's design and plan for that building. Um, and now I think that, you know, we're in 2024. His name has kind of fallen off a lot of people's radar again, and it shouldn't. Solomon Layton designed 16 courthouses, including the Oklahoma County Courthouse and the Beckham County Courthouse. Both of those are still being used today as courthouses. He designed 24 of the public school buildings that were around during his time. Uh, that was approximately two thirds of the buildings that existed are traced back to him. These included Central High School, which is now the OCU Law Library downtown, and El Reno High School, which is listed on the National Registry. Solomon Layton was the design of the Skirvin Hotel, the State Historic Building, buildings at OU, UCO, OCU, Chickasha Women's College, hospitals in Norman, Fort Supply in Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City YMCA, the Journal Record Building, the Governor's Mansion, 14 downtown high rises between 1908 and 1929. So again, with this kind of influence and this prominence in a young emerging state that is literally coming into formation from the dirt to these buildings, I have no doubt, um, my opinion only, won't accredit this to Shippo or anybody else, but I think there's probably thousands of buildings that feature influence from Solomon Layton, if not downright copycat designs of his work and has, of his architecture. I made a mention about Solomon Layton and the structure of his designs. Just absolutely incredible. And again, when you think back to no formal training and buildings that were built in the 1910s, 20s, 30s. So after the 1995 bombing in downtown Oklahoma City, there were 11 buildings designed by Solomon Layton that sustained damage from the bombing. And yet not one, not one had structural damage. How in the world, when he was designing these, did he know how to build them in, again, 1910, 1920s, in such a way that they could survive that kind of an impact? I mean, it just is mind-boggling to me. One of the buildings that he designed is actually now being used for the Bombing Memorial Museum, which is a, an amazing kind of passive tribute to his work. There appears, and I'm gonna use the word appears, bolded and underlined, to be only one structure of Solomon Layton's that did not withstand the test of time. Um, oh, I do wanna mention one other structure that um, speaks to the solidness of the buildings he designed. The Memorial Stadium down at Owen Field in Norman, his design was one story. In 1975, when they added the second story to that stadium, they did not have to go in and add any structural support. He built that strong enough and without any, at least as far as we know, thought or expectation that 50 years later we'd be adding a second story, but with enough structure and support that it could withstand that second story. And if you know the second story where the press box is off, it's a lot of concrete, a lot of weight. They didn't have to do anything to strengthen the original design of his to make that work. But in the mid-1960s, Canadian County Courthouse was torn down. It said that it was torn down for structural issues. Given what we know about all these other buildings and their ability to withstand 
improvements and second stories and bombings personally and again my my opinion although i can also attribute it to tommy's uh, because we have discussed this i think the decision to tear down the courthouse here in el reno in the 60s was more of a political decision and structure was used as a convenient excuse but if the history books are correct and there really was a structural issue, then as far as we know, that's really the only building that Solomon Layton built out of the hundreds that we know about that ha did not stand the test of time. There is a dispute in the research as to whether he has 22 or 52 buildings on the National Register of Historic Places. My guess is that somewhere along the way, a two got transposed to a five or a five got transposed to a two and somebody else has picked up that research. The National Register has changed its website and its search features. And so we have not been able to dig through and take the time it's gonna take under the, the new structure to figure out which of those numbers is correct. But again, for the geographic area that he worked in, the lack of formal education, that's a very impressive number to attribute to a single person. Personally, Solomon Layton was quite philanthropic. Um, I, I told you before, one of his nicknames was a good citizen. He kept an account where kids who needed shoes could go and he would make sure that new shoes were purchased on his dime. If he saw a poor child in the street, he would send them to his secretary who was under strict instructions to find out what was going on in that family, make sure they had food, make sure the kids had everything they need. And it was all done very much in secret. Um, we have found a few instances where as it relates to education buildings or Masonic Lodges, Solomon Layton did donate services from his firm because it was important for him that things be built right and he didn't want shortcuts taken because of a lack of money, particularly with a nonprofit or an education facility. He was an original member of the Oklahoma City Planning Commission, Commission, and he was active on the Oklahoma City Council of Defense in World War I. So, you know, not only this prolific career, but a heart for service, taking care of people, particularly children, and really someone who left his mark on the world. Now, the fact that Solomon Layton designed the old jail should be enough to justify its saving, but the old jail has a lot of other great features. Um, I did want to point this out to you. Um, we talk about, we'll talk a little bit more about the design features, but this is kind of a, a juxtaposition of the original courthouse that was in Canadian County torn down in the 60s and the current courthouse. And what you see with most utilitarian buildings, courthouses, jails, even schools, oftentimes more modern schools, they're very plain, these, you know, flat stucco beige walls and don't have this beautiful architecture and design that the courthouse had and so many of Solomon Layton buildings have. Um, the Preservation El Reno letterhead actually uses a picture of this courthouse and it was the destruction of the courthouse that led to the creation of Preservation El Reno. After it was torn down, there were a, a group of citizens who said, never again, we do not ever want to lose a beautiful building because it wasn't properly maintained or because citizens didn't get involved. And so that image of the old courthouse serves as a reminder for those of us working with Preservation El Reno now that these buildings need to be maintained. I should have shown you this slide earlier. In the center of the slide is our old jail um, that we're here to talk about today. But also as you look around the slide, you can see a number of the other buildings that he designed. And again, to me, this is why I cannot, I do not have the skill set to say, oh, that's clearly a Solomon Layton. I mean, just the, the design differences between the Skirvin and the Bizzle Library down at OU 
all his work, all his creation, all his, his genius. So let's talk about our jail. Solomon Layton built the plan, drew the plans for the old jail in 1905, and it was constructed, constructed and opened in 1907. It is the only public building in Canadian County that Solomon Layton designed. Now I'm often criticized or corrected on this point because the high school, the arena high school was also a Solomon Layton design. The high school is not considered a public building though, because it's not open to the public. It is a school. You can only go in by specific invitation at specific times. So maybe, you know, I guess maybe we can argue that there's two in Canadian County, but, but we really look at the jail as the, the last remaining public building that he designed. The, the jail is one of two county buildings that's still standing. Um, the other is the stables located right next door to the jail, and those were refurbished pretty heavily in late 1990s. This is actually the second jail in Canadian County. It was built because the original facility was unsafe and called a, quote, disgrace to the county. It is was built in the location, those of you that are familiar with El Reno, where the Carnegie Library currently stands. The jail was built in 1894 to house three to four men, or I'm sorry, the jail was designed to house three to four men I'm getting my numbers mixed up. I apologize. The jail was designed to host one or two men in a, in a cell. By 1894, the population of El Reno had grown so much that they were cramming three to four men into a cell. And people started to take notice. And there were starting to be letters to the editor and conversations. It took 10 years, though, before the commissioners finally called for plans for a new jail. The overcrowding in the original jail where the library now stands, led to extremely unsanitary conditions. It also led to a lot of prisoner escapes, which really was a big problem back in um, from the early 1900s up until about the 1920s, even pushing into the 1930s. The jail at the time it was built was called the best facility in the state, one of the top facilities in the region, and it became a model for other jails. There are reports of a group coming up from Fort Worth, Texas, who looked at the jail and said, this is perfect. This is what we need. Build us this just a little bit bigger. Um, so again, that's you know kind of what I say, there's probably a lot of copycat designs. They took our jail that Solomon Layton did for us and, and made another one in Fort Worth. The um, jail, once it was fully outfitted, could hold 56 inmates. By the 1930s, its max usage was at about 58%. So the jail really was designed to be big enough to serve the county for a number of years. And it did, in fact, operate as a jail for 78 years. Shortly after opening, a settee was purchased for outside the jail. The newspaper article, though, was clear to point out that the sheriff and undersheriff wanted you to know that that settee was not intended for spooners. They did not want any open public displays of affection outside their jail in 1907. On at least one occasion, the jail was used to hold packages that had been delivered. Um, at least shortly after it was opened, a new puppy was ordered and delivered to El Reno before its new owner returned back home. And so the jail housed the puppy for a few days and kept him safe until the owner to, came home. Jim Crow laws did not escape the jail. Um, they reached inside. There was in the men's area. So the, this jail was, we'll talk about some of the design features in a minute, but in the men's area of the jail, the upper cells were dedicated to black inmates. The lower cells were for the white. Um, for a long time, they had one black woman serve, or serving a sentence in the jail. When a white woman came along, 
they had to order a second bathtub for her. And the white woman went at least a week, probably closer to two, without having a single bath because the bathtub was for the black woman and she was there first and they had to wait for a second bathtub. Um, so even within the facility, you, you see a reflection of what was going on in society outside. If you were caught drinking during prohibition, then that landed you in the jail for 30 days. And many of the inmates in the 1910, 1920s time period were there for either being caught drinking outright or a crime that was committed because they were drunk, such as accidentally taking a different carriage home from the bar than the one that you actually owned. In 1923, the Canadian County Jail accepted all inmates from the King Kingfisher County because that jail was so unsanitary. And the Canadian County Jail was still um, 20 years, at this point, 15 years after it was built, said to be the best in the state and beyond what any other jail could offer these inmates. Um, even evaluations and reviews from the state board that were conducted of the jail in the 20s, 30s, and going into the 40s gave the jail A ratings, noted that it was a fantastic facility, that it was a model facility, and, and really something that El Reno and Canadian County should have been proud of, and as we're going to discuss some more, should continue to be proud of. Um, the inmates were not forgotten at Christmas in 1925, at least that year, I suspect others. We um, know that the inmates were given gifts of apples, oranges, and, can and candy. Um, and I know in recent years, a, the community Christmas dinner that's hosted in town continued to provide a Christmas meal for the inmates at our county jail, even though the location's now changed. Um, so El Reno is definitely a town that that recognizes its importance of being a county seat and embraces those that are here for a county facility as opposed to just a city facility. In the late 1950s, the jail was built onto for additional office space. And in the 1970s, there was um, a build a building that was added to connect the jail to the stables. In 1991, those were both removed. And so the structure as it sits today is how it was designed by Solomon Layton. Um, uh, this structure, like I said, operated for 78 years. It was not until the mid 80s that the new jail was built. Uh, technically the third jail, though most people think of it as the second jail, and the inmates were moved over there. The building was used as county offices for a couple of more years after that, and then for storage until about three years ago. In 1985, the jail was placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it was added to Preservation Oklahoma's endangered list in 2021 we will be applying to put the jail back on the 2024 endangered list because of its current condition. So the jail was very unique in several design aspects. First of all, it was capable of housing 24 men, plus it had an area for women, plus it had an area for boys. So all the um, criminals or who were awaiting trial or convicted could be housed in the same facility safely. The jail had steam heat, which was very new and very modern for 1907 and continued to serve the jail until the mid 80s. Um, window unit air conditioners were added on, but the steam heat continued to be used. The jail had a separate meeting space for attorneys and clients. Again, think about, you know, we're we're right at the beginning of statehood and already recognizing the importance of the attorney client relationship, the importance of 
those that are serving time who haven't gotten out on bail or, you know, have a conviction that they want to appeal, that they can have some private time with their attorneys. And, and as an attorney, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that that was a design feature that was added in. You know, something that did not exist in a lot of jails that were built and being used at this time. The jail looks from the outside like a one story building, but it actually is two stories. And Really, I'd like to call it three stories because it does have a small basement, um, but it is technically two stories. The second story has cells for inmates we talked about, and then it also has an office place, an office space and almost like a mini apartment for the jailer. So the jailer could have a place to stay overnight. This jail was extremely unique in that they designed two escape routes for the jailer. So in the event of a prison riot, the jailer could escape through one of two tunnels and escape two manholes that were on the sidewalk outside of the jail. Been very forward thinking. Solomon Layton was a big fan of tunnels. He promoted them in a lot of buildings. The design was not always accepted, but he recognized that there's value in this space underground and that that can be a way to help people move and transition between buildings, or in this case, to safety without getting stuck in the middle of a prison riot. One of the most unique features of the jail is the single lever cell opener. And it's hard to see on this, but this actually still exists in the jail. It is from the, um, oh, Tommy, help me, the names excite me. Polly. Polly. The Polly Jail Company, which still exists today and still makes jail components. So the Polly Jail Company designed this. And as near as we can tell, it was really the first jail they used it in. And what it was is just that. It got its trademark in 1897, I believe the marker shows. But a they could use one lever to open or close all cells at the same time, making it more efficient for the jailers and really a lot more more safer than having to open one cell, have his back to that cell, cell while he went to go open the next one, and so on and so forth. Um, the um, One of the state inspectors for the jail before it opened saw this in use, was so impressed by the technology of the poly company that he actually quit working for the state of Oklahoma, went to go work for poly, and went on to travel around the nation selling this feature to other jails and for use in other facilities. Um, that jail inspector and the others declared this jail to be a model for other counties and don't know, haven't really seen anything where as much as Fort Worth did, where they said, hey, yes, recreate this down for us three hours south um, within the state of Oklahoma, but we have no doubt as such a model jail, uh, such a modern, modern jail, that as other counties or even municipalities were starting to improve their facilities through the 1920s, 50s, probably even into the 60s, that they would visit our jail in Canadian County and use that for design inspiration. Um, the jail structures are still there. The cells are there. Um, the beds are there. There are sink toilet combinations that are there. Some of the cages were moved to the new jail in the 1980s, but structurally it is so easy to just put yourself back in time and, you know, what those inmates and jailers would have seen and experienced for 78 years, but but particularly when this building first opened in 1907. As I mentioned before, prisoner escapes were a big problem during this time frame and in the time that this jail was being designed and built. And that's because most jails at the time were just simple frame buildings. Solomon Layton came along and he took that idea and threw it out the window and built this structure that is quite substantive, that is brick, you see the bars on the window, um, the big stones, and really 
stopped inmates from escaping. Now, fast forward 40-ish years, there were a couple of inmates who managed to escape through the roof of the jail. Um, probably something that Solomon Layton didn't anticipate. Still not quite sure how they managed that. But um, we can't say that our jail was without escapees. Those two prisoners were caught a day or two later and, and returned to the facility and a year was added onto their sentence for their escape attempt. But other counties who were experiencing these huge numbers of escapes and could not keep their prisoners in place really loved this design and the ability to keep people in who should be kept in and keep out the people who don't need to be there. Um, down in the basement of the jail, there is still an old cabinet that is marked uh, toothpaste and toothbrushes. I was both disappointed and relieved to see that the cabinet was empty. Uh, there's nothing in it right now, but like I said before, it's very easy to walk in that facility and see what life was like for those who were there. Um, the jail is a masonry building with a symmetrical T-shaped floor plan. The west elevation is the front of the building, although the way that the county courthouse and new jail and things have kind of been designed when they were built in the 80s, it almost seems like the south elevation should be the front, but what you're looking at now is the, the west elevation. Um, the major wall openings have tall wood framed windows. The Except for the windows at the main entrance, then all the other windows on the side and all the back are covered with iron barns, iron bars and had red painted screens. This design is an Italian Renaissance design, and it was, was and remains so unique for its design in a utilitarian building. Again, if we go back and we look at the courthouses and the design of the courthouse at the turn of the century versus the courthouse of today, we see beautiful design versus very utilitarian. Think about the jail in your county, um, Canadian County, I'm sorry, not Canadian, Cleveland County, Oklahoma City Jail. Those are very plain, flat, no architectural detail. This was not, is not. It is a beautiful building. It has those great columns out front. It was designed to match the neighborhood at the time it was built. Again, for those of you that are familiar with El Reno, where the current county jail sits now was actually houses and Solomon Layton wanted the jail to fit in with the neighborhood so the size of the jail is actually not that much bigger than what a house on that block in that area would have been and it was designed to fit that so again if you think about what I talked about early in the presentation with all of his different design structures and um, types that he was able to use, was it the whim of the day or was it him really knowing his clients and him picking a design that would blend right in and re a recognition that that's something that would have been important to the community when this was built in, in 1907. Um, the original roof was a slate roof. Today, we have an asphalt roof. When the stables next door were replaced, that a metal roof was put on. Um, I will show you a current picture of our jail. This is the jail and it's um, sad asphalt roof. Which we're gonna talk about some more in a minute. Um, plans are eventually to put a new metal roof on, but in the short term, our current plan is to go back with an asphalt roof. It is cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. It is faster. It's a lot of renovation that we want to do. And so the plan is to put an asphalt roof back on. 
recognize this is Oklahoma. Give it three to five years for a good hail claim. And at that point, there will be insurance money that can help. And we won't be trying to fund a number of repairs at one time. And then we can put the more permanent metal roof on that will match the stables. It will not be the original design of a slate, but in terms of long-term preservation, the metal roof makes the most sense. So how did the jail get to this very sad state? Um, a number of factors and a number of lessons that Preservation Law Reno has learned along the way. The county did lease the jail to Preservation El Reno. The terms of the lease, we re recent, very recently learned, included that Preservation El Reno was in charge of insuring the jail and covering the jail's roof. That didn't happen. And there's a couple of reasons, I you know, that it probably didn't happen. One thing, and... Um, I, I should give my normal disclaimer here. This may sound like legal advice. I'm not giving any legal advice. This is just Amy's opinions and experience in working as uh, working with nonprofits. But um, the a lot of nonprofits set up their boards so that people rotate off. So you maybe have a two year or four year term and then you rotate off. I am not a fan of those kinds of boards because you lose institutional history. There is at, at some point you get a whole new board. Now, a lot of people like those boards because it brings new ideas, new energy, and, and that is fine and that is good and you need that too. But what happened with this board and this building is that all the people who were involved in signing that lease and taking on the requirements for the roof fell off. And nobody who was on the board in the last 10, maybe even 15 years knew that that was a requirement. Nobody thought to look at the lease and see, hey, what is required of us? At some point, there should have been a trigger from somebody, a treasurer or something of, hey, where's the insurance bill? Where's, you know, oh, they're sending us a renewal. They're sending us a reminder. We need to pay this. Why have we been paying this? I don't know what happened there. I wasn't involved with the organization at the time, um, but that, that trigger got missed. And so then the bill didn't get paid one year and nobody knew to pay it in future years. And fast forward to 2023 and we get a copy of the lease and we see that, what was given to us as a responsibility has not been upheld. Um, whether that could, should have been negotiated in the original lease in the first place is a whole nother question, but that's what the county gave to Preservation El Reno. There was also a major problem, um, like I mentioned, the building was used for storage until about three years ago. That was in the lease when the county stopped using it as office buildings in the mid 80s. They put evidence in there and so nobody could go into the building but a sheriff's deputy um, because of the evidence and because of the necess necessity to preserve chain of custody and that sort of thing. But at this, because nobody could go in there, nobody could see what kind of damage was being done. Nobody could detect early leaks in the roof before they became big holes. Nobody knew um, that there was that there was a problem, and so that conversations that really started happening the last, I'd say, eighteen months, should have been happening a good five, ten years ago, and. Or that you know, all the conversations were, hey, when can we get access to this building? The they weren't the right conversations, and you didn't have the right players or the right personalities involved to really put some pressure on the county to say, hey, you know, get this stuff out. We need to renegotiate this lease, something so that something different happen could happen. Um, of course, with a lot of organizations and, and businesses, COVID impacted this process. So Tommy and I really started noticing holes developing probably around 2018, 2019. They were small. Um, the jail was not near the pigeon housing facility that it is now. 
Um, and again, that's when conversations really should have been had with the sheriff and with the county commissioners about repairs, about access, about not letting the jail get to the point that it has. Then COVID hit. Um, the Preservation Art Reno board was not meeting. The sheriffs and, you know, um, all employers were just focused on keeping people safe. And, and Several during the same time period, 2019 through 2022, some of the preservation board members moved away uh, because the board was not meeting regularly. Those members were not replaced to keep a full board um, in place. The um, leaders who were still involved had health issues that they were struggling with, which of course has to take priority. And so it just was a, a, a bad storm of events that really led to the jail's deterioration and, and what it is now. The roof is the jail's biggest problem. Um, because of the holes in the roof there, like I said, there's a, a, a pigeon population in there. Um, there is some mold in there that has to be remediated, easily fixable. We I've met with the restoration company and the um, who will improve that air quality once the roof gets replaced. And that's the first step structurally um, and in large part because it's a Solomon Layton building. Structurally, it's in great shape. And really, the only thing the structural engineer identified, um, if you look very closely below those red doors, you'll see some crumbling of the steps. Not a true structural problem like we think of structural problems. The building is sound. The building is extremely well built and the building will be here for another 120 years once we get it preserved. Um, so we we got to this point and the building got to this point where got to get a roof on it. Absolutely got to get a roof on it. it. needs to happen yesterday. The county asked for a lease back of the jail so that it could take on a roof. That was, I want to say that was right before COVID. Um, you know, we kind of use COVID as a big time marker, but it seems like it was right in that time frame where the county asked for that. Preservation looked at the proposal, agreed to the lease back, and uh, said preservation had not been particularly active in years four. Preservation was needing, preservation I say mean that I say preservation of Reno. I don't mean preservation of Oklahoma or any other preservation. Our preservation um, was, you know, kind of needing some new leadership. We didn't have the funds for a roof. We didn't appreciate that we needed to be saving the funds for the roof, that that was falling on our responsibility. So the county asked for a lease back. And the purpose of the lease back was so that as soon as the evidence got removed, or I think by then maybe the evidence had just been removed, they could replace the roof. The county, as you can see from the pictures, did not replace the roof. Um, it ended up being much more, first of all, it from the time of the lease back to today, it has been a couple more years. And once holes start developing, they just get bigger faster. And so they, the roof was not replaced. By the time the county started getting bids for replacing the roof, there were trusses that need to be replaced. There are some architectural features. I don't know if you can see them very well from this picture, but the red wood um, that kind of peeks out underneath the asphalt roof, some of those need to be replaced. And then of course there's the interior cleanup that now needs to be done because this building has been open to the elements for some time. Um, so the county ultimately said that's, more than what we intended when we said that we would replace the roof and it's going to cost too much money to not only to replace the roof but to get this building where it is safe for people to go in and out of it again because of the air quality and so the county voted to tear it down which was a very sad day for my husband and preservation all reno um the and so what next, what, um, you know, kind of where, where do you go from there once, once that decision was made? There were two paths that were discussed. One was the, um, sue everybody in court 
take them to city hall, fight the man kind of path. You would think as a lawyer that would I would have been the leader of that path. Um, that is not my style. And the path that we took and that ultimately ended up being successful was what I'll call the flies with honey path. The, um, you know, let's let's go back. Let's get some some different faces in front of the commissioners. Let's talk to them and let's see. And so about a week after the vote was to tear the jail down, I reached out to one of the commissioners and I said, is there a path to save the building? If, if there's not, if the decision is done, you know, the bids have been asked for for the destruction, let me know. Um, but, but thankfully, I was told no, that there was a path and that the path needed to include a very clear plan, some very clear details for how we were going to save this building and, and a plan for moving forward. So we did just that. We put together a very detailed plan, and I mean detailed to the point of within 24 hours, this is the step we're going to take. Within 48 hours, this is the step we're going to take. Within two weeks, we're going to be here. Within three months, we're going to be here. Within 12 months, we're going to be there. Now, have all those deadlines worked exactly the way I want them to? No. Um, some things are taking a little longer. Some things went a little bit faster, but we presented that to the county to show We've thought this through. We are dedicated. We know this isn't just as easy as snapping our fingers and suddenly we have the building back to what it was in, in 1907 and that we're willing to, to put in the work. Um, and in fact, and one of my pitches to the county that made its way to the newspaper and then has made its way onto the shirts that Preservation Arena now's we now wears, said, you know, if you will give us this building back, then you don't have to spend another dime on it and you can just sit back and watch us work. And so that's what we've been doing. That campaign, that effort was successful. The commissioners voted to let us have the building back. And so we now have a new lease for Preservation Arena. There is no evidence stored inside. There is nothing inside the building other than what uh, gifts the pigeons have left us and the cabinet that says toothbrushes and toothpaste. And we are working on getting a new roof. Um, ultimately, we have great plans and a great vision for this building that um, we would like to see it as both a museum and an education center. The museum would have uh, permanent exhibits on Solomon Layton and a lot of that history that I shared with you, including, you know, even as, as recent tie-ins as the 1995 bombing and the 2022 capital improvements. Um, the museum would have a portion on the Canadian County Courthouse, including um, pictures of all of our district judges and noting um, such things as the first female district judge that we just got last year in Judge Drubar. And then a section on the sheriff and law enforcement and telling some of those stories. There are stories of prohibition to be told and what that looked like in our county. There are stories to be told about law enforcement and and even, some, you know, I, I envision an exhibit that goes from, you know, a single pistol that law enforcement would have used when the jail opened all the way up to the tactical equipment that Canadian County Sheriff's Office uses now. And we have been in conversations with the sheriff and with that office as to really working together and letting us tell their stories through this building. But the education component is huge for the future plans for this building architects, future architects, those that are going to college need to see Solomon Layton's work. They need to see it up close. They need to touch it. They need to be in it. And I, I'm hoping that we, and maybe it's, you know, a lofty goal, but I want to inspire a new generation or maybe not a full generation, but a couple of architects to not build boring, beige, flat, utilitarian buildings, to look at something like this jail and the beautiful columns and the design, bringing that Italian Renaissance design into a neighborhood, building for the community, not just for the purpose. And that's something that architecture has lost in a lot of ways. And so um, 
actually about two weeks before we met with the commissioners um, and they reversed their decision and let us have the jail back, OU, uh, School of Architecture, one of their professors reached out and he wanted to bring a group of students. And this building, when it's restored, will really cater to that and provide a place for architecture students all over the state and really all over the region to come in and look at what we have. Um, we also have a library that's in the, the process of a large di digitization, and those images are going on to Gateway, Oklahoma. That paper won't be needed anymore. Tommy and I are big fans of paper, and we'd like to see a place where somebody can still go and dig through paper and, and still work with the paper of things and not just do things on, on computers. Um, and then this this facility will no doubt become a tour spot. It is located just off Route 66, though we already have several Route 66 tour spots in El Reno, the Canadian County Museum. People come from all over the world to visit that museum. And we are looking forward to when people come from all over the world to, to see a jail and to see what criminal justice in America looked like for a long period of time and for criminal justice students to see to start and um, to to really open that back up. Um, I see that I have used most of my time. I don't know if we have any questions that came through, but I will leave um, the email address for Preservation El Reno here so that if you do have questions, you can email those to us and we'll happily respond. I'd also encourage you to follow us on Facebook. That way you can watch the renovation of the jail in, in kind of real time. And when we're ready to have that ribbon cutting in a couple of years, you'll be able to attend that. So thank you for, again, for spending your lunch. Kristen, is there any questions or anything else? Thank you so much, Amy, for this presentation and for all of the work you've done. Um, I will let you know that our National Register Coordinator confirmed that by last count, there are 52 uh, National Register of Historic Places listed buildings in Oklahoma that have been attributed to Layton's firm. So I can give Thanks. that number. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you for confirming that. And we will send notes to all the newspapers that have it wrong. <laughs> Perfect. And we just, <laughs> we probably just have a, a minute left, but uh, could you answer this question, which we've received, which is many communities are working to save buildings, um, that are currently in a condition similar to the Canadian County Jail, what recommendation or tip might you give um, to help guide them in their preservation efforts? If you can just say something here at the end. Yeah, I would say have a, a plan, a detailed plan, a thorough plan. If you want to email me, I will happily send you the plan that we use for the commissioners to show them we were serious, that we were not naive, that it wasn't just a, oh, please, sir, you know, let's save this building. It's so pretty that, that we recognize it's work, it's money, it's time. And here's a group of people that are willing to do it. And, and even as part of that, I went so far as to create the brochure um, that we would be using, again, to show we were serious about this. And I think the more you can show the community and the decision makers that, you know, you're, you're realistic about what it takes to preserve a building and that you have support and you have a leadership team that isn't just going to visit this topic every, you know, six, nine, 12 months, but is ready to work daily, weekly, whatever it takes. It made a difference in our case. And I can't imagine that it wouldn't make a difference in other communities. I think that's fantastic advice. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, again, we encourage everybody to to reach out to you via email or you can reach out to our office. Um, we hope to see you back for our next uh, Lunch and Learn presentation in February. And uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your uh, your week. <laughs>